So welcome everyone. Tonight we're doing backyard mushroom growing and our special guest this evening is Mark Goskowitz. He's from Tri Gable Lee Farm. And look, he's friendly and he's waving to you all. I think that's wonderful. Um, tonight, you're all gonna learn how to grow three popular species of mushroom, the shiitake, oyster, and wine cap. Sounds exciting. And um, a little bit more about Mark. He and his partner, Naomi Neiman, operate the Tri Gable Lee Farm in Colchester, Connecticut and they offer educational workshops on beekeeping, mushrooms, preservation, keeping chickens, and so much more. Um, they are growing cool stuff, wholesome produce in a bi biodynamic practice. Um, and so for more information about Tri Gable Lee Farm and what they're doing there, you can go to trygablelee.com. Um, and so on that happy note, I would like to give a warm welcome to Mark and um, let you take away backyard mushroom growing. Welcome. Thanks. All right. Welcome aboard, everybody. Yep. Mark Oskowitz here. Um, and I've got my props around me, some others that are within arm's reach. I'm an eighth grade uh, math teacher. So uh, I've been doing this all day. And, and then now you get me, <laughs> you get me at the end of the day here. Um, so I'm used to talking, but I'm also used to like, teaching this in a normal year, not like the year that we have now. Typically, I also have a school garden. That's where I'm getting at. And um, and and I have my like own house farm and everything that we have here. The farm here at the house started like about like nine, 10 years ago or so around the time when my daughter was born. And that's when a lot of things are like timed. And I know when the trees were planted because they planted them the same year my daughter was born, the fruit trees and stuff. Um, and and we used to grow veggies and stuff like that on, on a on a large scale and, and sell them and stuff. But it got exhausting. Um, it's a lot to do that and to teach. And so I was always teaching, um, teaching all these like little things with my school, my school kids, the seventh and eighth graders. Um, and it was just like a natural transition. Our business transitioned to like educational stuff. Um, so that's what that's what you, you get from me. All my lessons, I test them out on my students first and I get their questions. Um, and I, I get to hear like their points of view and try to make it understandable for them. So I try, you know, that's hopefully what you get from this is that is that um, I'm not just any old presenter. I'm somebody who does know how to teach. And so I try to I try to um, you're going to see that I use lots of visuals. Um, I try to reframe the way you think about different things about fungi and stuff like that um, and, and, and give you lots of tools. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and and go go straight to some of those some of those tools, and um, and so one of them which I already put in the chat. Um, let's see, I got to make my own face smaller. There we go. Get get rid of that. Um, so so one of the things that 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 you have is is my, um, the handouts that go along with this. I'm, of course, I'm a teacher. So I, like, I know that people learn differently. Some people like just hearing this and seeing, seeing me do this, that's gonna be good enough for them. Other people are gonna prefer to, to come back, to read things. They're gonna want the bulleted list of, of stuff. So that's what you have here. Um, this goes in the same order that our presentation goes where we're gonna talk about wine caps and growing, growing mushrooms in wood chip beds. And then we're gonna talk about oyster mushrooms and how to grow them on stumps and totems and stuff. Um, but they can also be grown on logs, but I save that for shiitakes because shiitakes, um, you'll learn log culture, um, but they can also be grown in totems, which, which we would have already covered. So as we talk about the three different types of mushrooms that are really easy for, for beginners to start uh, growing, <clears throat> we, we also learn about three different methods of growing mushrooms. Um, yeah, and so, so, and then at the end of this, I definitely have more stuff that we never even get to in class, in a class like this. It's just more reading, more reading. And I've got a set of uh, recommended next steps for, for you to take and, and videos that you can watch. I've, I've curated this as a much bigger resource beyond this like one hour, hour and a half, whatever session it ends up being um, to keep you, keep you learning and point you in the right direction. So, so I've got all that you know, in, in the handouts, plus the, the, the um, presentation that we'll see, um, you'll have access to this because that's also embedded in right there. There's the link to the presentation. You click on this link here, it brings you to the presentation. So really all you need to do is just in the future, just keep the link to the handouts and you'll have everything. So this is a Google Doc. Um, what a Google Doc means is that 
it's a document that's on the online. And so a bunch of you are already there. I'm looking at you at the top and it has live links in it. But here's the great thing is that as I've been teaching this class um, year after year after year, I keep updating and adding resources to my documents. So, so honestly, people who had taken this class three years ago, if they check in, they have access to the same document, the same presentation, but now with even more resources. That's what all I'm just kind of saying to you is that like, if you find that like you look at this now and then you're like, eh, I don't think this is the year to do it. But like next year, you're like really into it. Go back to that set of resources and you'll see if I've updated stuff or whatever. You'll still have everything from this great class anyway. Um, I don't necessarily have to like go over books and stuff because the books that I recommend are also in that set in that set of links. So, you know, it's lovely to do this in, in, uh, in choreography or, or being supported by a lot, uh, a library, because if you know how that works, you can, you can loan one of those books out from another library, go on and search for them. You can request these books. Um, and I've done the hard part of reading through really dozens and dozens of, of books um, and finding the ones that really were the most helpful. And, and so this presentation, of course, is a summary of the stuff that I've learned um, and my own experiences in growing mushrooms, gosh, probably seven, eight years or so. Um, and I've had lots of failures. So what you're going to hear is like, I have tips and tricks that you really won't hear from, um, from what, if you just Google this stuff online. You're going to find plenty of free information online, but there's also some things that like are not best practices. What you're going to get from me are best practices that have worked year after year after year and and things that I've learned from from failures. Uh, it, you know, you'll get you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. All right. So let's let's dive in and keep keep going back to stuff. So I'm going to start with the presentation um, and because it's you know, that's that's where we start. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Okay, now, as I'm presenting, if you need to like, if you're the type of person who needs to see my lips to, to like, just to understand me a little bit more, you wanna make my face bigger, with Zoom, you should be able to like, take my face, make it a little bit bigger and smaller um, as needed. So here's our farm, here's our farm. You know, that's our logo. Um, hey, hey, can't hurt to promote and just say, if you like this by at the end and everything, we've got a bazillion classes, not a bazillion. That's not a real number. I'm a math teacher. Okay, so but um, we've got a we have a bunch of classes that are pre-recorded and they're available on de on demand. And so just like this, you get a presentation just like this and the set of handouts. Um, and then I also have live dates that that are in a calendar that you can purchase and register for those. Bam! It's like all right. There's a whole bunch of classes that we do from preserving the harvest kombucha. Blah. There's a whole bunch of stuff. If you end up liking me, then you'll probably like other things. This is like. You know, if, if you were purchasing like me on Amazon, it, it also say, well, you might also like these classes as well. It, it really is a thing. Once you find a teacher that you like, you probably you might want to stick with me. So we start off with what is a mushroom and how do they reproduce and thrive? So it's not like getting too crazy into the biology, but but it is worth talking about it. So this is a picture that I took um, when my wife and I, we went to um, we went to uh, Alaska. Um, to Denali National Park, which is a national park that's the size of Massachusetts, and it has one road going through the whole thing. That's just mind-blowing in itself. It's one national park as big as a whole state with one road. And, you know, anyway, while, while we were there, you do a lot of hiking and everything. And I started taking like all these cool little macro pictures and everything. And I love this one because when I look at it now, I actually have learned so much about mushrooms that I have a deeper respect and understanding for what I'm looking at in this little micro shot here where we've got the mosses growing. We've got lichen popping up through the mosses and then fungi popping up through all of that. And then other like little, little um, plants and everything. The thing is, is that typically, um, typically fungi and, and mushrooms, they are going to be, um, there's many different types of fungi out in the world. The fungi that we're going to talk about the are mushroom producing fungi and so they're not they're not parasitic which there are parasitic fungi out there just you know my dad had a parasitic fungi on his foot okay so um and and it's in so the mushrooms that we're also going to talk about they are not like the ones that you'd get in the grocery store fresh your button mushrooms your creminis your portobellas they're not like those because those are compost mushrooms meaning in order to grow them the people the people that are growing them are getting compost you know compost stuff that's pretty much decomposed 
and they're growing fungi in the in trays in in like dark cellars and stuff like that and in like a cave like environment and that's not what we're doing we are growing so i'm in connecticut just like you and um in colchester connecticut so so and i am growing all of these mushrooms outdoors in the natural environment some people will take this class and they're like but should i bring it in in the wind no no don't bring it in your house like you'll end up with like stuff like this in your house which is exactly what I did. I opened up my box that had my books in it and I accidentally put this mushroom log, which is alive in the Rubbermaid tote. And it's been sitting there for just two weeks. And in two weeks time, it started like decomposing and almost started to like get my books and my handouts. So it does not belong in there. I, again, you know, I like to keep my, my house nice and clean and mushroom growing is not something that is a nice and clean hobby. It's it's like if you're going to try and grow seedlings in your house, you're going to make a mess. You need a dedicated space to it. So we talk about growing mushrooms outdoors. Okay, we go back to the presentation. See, it's a little bit of back and forth. You see my face and then we don't. And that. All right. And man, he's only gotten through one slide. Don't worry, we got more. Um, so so this year I, I started mushroom hunting. And all I want to show you is that the, like, the types of mushrooms that we're going to grow are not mushrooms that grow on live trees like these. They're going to be mushrooms that are that are the primary decomposers. So this oyster mushroom is the one of the primary decomposers of this. Uh, I think it's a hemlock that that was here, part of a hemlock force, um, and that's what we're going to learn to grow. So when a tree when a tree dies in the woods, yeah, it makes a sound. Okay, it falls over, it hits the ground. Doesn't matter if anybody's around to hear it. But that tree then becomes a food source for whatever's around that can digest that that woody, like the lignin and the structure of the of the wood that's very fibrous and hard to break down. And fungi have like cracked the key of like how to break that open and of make those nutrients available not only for them but then available for other decom decomposers. So the fungi that we're going to grow are ones that are primary decomposers, not the composting mushrooms, the button mushrooms, cremini's and all those that and the portobellas that are that are like at the end stage of um, decomposition. So um, so so these are wild mushrooms, but like you can learn. I mean, you can find turkey tail out in the woods. Um, so it's not going to be mushrooms like these last two, where if you look at the, the wood that this mushroom was growing on, this was growing on wood that had already had a primary decomposer go through it. The vast majority of resources in, in, this, in this log had already been used up, meaning you do not want to use wood like this, okay? You do not want to use logs that look like this because you won't be growing the types of fungi that we want to grow, okay? I think that's one of the great things, and you won't be like, yeah, this is it's just like another type of mushroom, whatever. It's part of this is to show you the diversity of life. And so we're seeing the fruiting bodies. The, the, the mushroom is the fruiting body for the fungi. Um, and so this is what, what we are looking for, this white little tissue. Now I know when you were when you were like a little kid, or who knows, maybe just the other day, and you're playing, you know, in the woods, you're playing in the garden, and you let's just say you you know what this is like. You know, there's that board, that wooden board that you just left on the ground. And it's been sitting there for a couple months. And you lift the board up and it's got all the white fungus on it. Well, that's that's what we're trying to create. We are trying to get something to decompose a log or wood chips or or whatever it is that's our growing media and and get that to get colonized. All right. So um da, 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 da. I know I keep leaving things. All right, so. And so as we think through things, I think there was just a few more to think. So we're going to be going from from and talking about this and getting the fungi to to infect like straw. And this is an example of the fungal tissue infecting a totem structure. So totem is just like a, a bigger diameter log that's just standing up on end and it's cut into rings. We'll show you how to make those. And it's interesting, like this little like demo thing that I have, this is just the cut piece off of another log that was infected with a fungi that I, that I infected it with a shiitake strain. And it just kept growing, just like this log, um, the fungi uh, had a successful colonization within that plastic bag. Um, okay, so this, so I'm a watercolorist as well. Um, so, so I made some quick illustrations, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, whatever. I'm proud, not proud, whatever, they're quick, all right? They're not my best work, but they're good enough. In this illustration, what am I showing you? I am showing you that with the skills today, 
that we're going to talk about, you're going to learn how to grow mushrooms in wood chip or straw beds all on their own or underneath plantings that you already have around your house, whether they're ornamental or whether they're vegetable plants or your raspberries, your strawberries, or your apple trees, you, you know, in an orchard. Okay, so that's one thing that you're gonna learn, wood chips and straw, wood chips and straw. Okay, An another thing that you'll learn is the totem method, which can also be used to inoculate stumps. Now, every tree only has one stump, so it's not likely that like you're gonna have a lot of these around. Well, odds are when you're working with logs, you're probably going to be importing those from somebody else's yard or some other job that's been done. But anyway, those logs, you know, the, these are standalone things. Then there's portable logs culture, meaning we're going to learn how to inoculate logs so that you could sit next to a log like I am on your couch um, and um, and have have those logs in stacks or with. So I'm not going to get into it today, but the skills that you'll learn today you can use for to grow mushrooms that are um, that are, the logs are buried. That's what I'm showing you here. Is that um, is that some some sometimes you're good if you really get into this, you're gonna be like, oh, I want to grow hen of the woods. Well, you know what? You're gonna need to bury that log. If you you know you inoculate the log, you get it ready to go, and then when it looks like this, all white and ready, you, you put it in the ground and you bury it. So, so um, what else have we got here? The mushroom life cycle, that is definitely worth going over. So a uh, fungi out in, out in the forest, you know, uh, it, you know, a log that's already infected, it's gonna, it's end stage is going to have mushrooms where it casts those spores. And those spores scatter through the habitat and land on some new resource, some new material to digest. And then, so those spores, they end up, they end up mating in, in a way, sport, you know, and, and what we have is something called the spawn run. And that's the amount of time that it takes the, the initial little colony that started here to colonize, fully colonize the whole log. Now, this is the mind blowing part, is that when it, um, when it fully colonizes the log, this log right here, okay? I inoculated it in different spots, okay? But what happens is each of these drill holes that's filled with sawdust with the fungal spores, and not spores, but the fungal tissue in there, they reconnect and become one living organism. And that's just like, that's just mind blowing. You can't chop me up and then just put me in a pile and my body reassembles itself. But with the fungi, that's exactly what happens is that you literally chop up the tissue of it and then disperse it among the stuff that you're growing in and it reconnects into the into a living organism again and when it's fully colonized it that is when it finally so when it's fully mm, infected you can think of it that way infected the the growing material that's there it finally has a critical mass of of resources that it can digest to finally fruit and create mushrooms so that life cycle is something that we're trying to we're trying to gain that life cycle um and get successfully get full colonization um, until little mushrooms start popping out of the logs. I got like a little, a little prop here. This is, so by the way, I, when I do log culture and stuff like that, I always have like remnants and like logs that aren't even worth selling to people. And this is an example of one of them, but it was still successful. It still had its first mushroom. So I know that this will still fruit mushrooms. However, this is going to, it doesn't have a lot of wood in it. So it's going to have a very short life, meaning it'll probably fruit for a year maybe a second year, but that's about it. While a log, you know, a log that has much more biomass to it, that's two, three, four feet long um, and, and, and bigger in diameter and all, um, it's gonna have more biomass, it's going to have more food. Its fruitings are going to be heavier and it's, uh, it's going to have a longer lifetime of fruiting. So, so a log like this will continue fruiting for at least three years, if not four or five or six years. Um, and it's gonna fruit in like a bell curve. Meaning, meaning it's first fruiting, it's going to have like one little mushroom, one or two little mushrooms. It's second fruiting, it's going to have more, the third fruiting, more and more and more. And then it'll hit a peak, probably it's second or third year, and then die, die, drop off uh, as it consumes the resources. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, this guy talks, huh? That's, that's what I do. Aren't I a teacher? I'm showing you. Uh, I am ready to just like keep giving you information. This isn't how I teach at school though, because this would be bad teaching at school to just keep talking and talking and talking, but you're adults. So I assume you can handle this. All right. The good thing is that there's a recording. And if this is too fast, you just watch the recording later on, which will be on the, the library's YouTube channel. You just hit pause. 
you go go make a snack and then you come back and Netflix and chill with me. All right. So so the colonization that fully colonization that then triggers when we get the right temperature and moisture conditions, it triggers fruiting. So so the mushrooms that we're going to be talking about fruit at a lot of a big variety of of temperature conditions. But when are they never fruiting winter? OK, so that's when the whole system just goes dormant. Um, but but a lot of the stuff that we're going to grow will fruit in the fall or fruit in the spring when the temperatures kind of cool and wet. That's when my logs are like are popping with mushrooms. And so that starts the whole life cycle all over again. Let's move into it because we need to get the skills. Um, you know what? I'm going to I'm just going to leave this this. I'm not even going to go over it because we don't we don't have time to go over everything. And it's in the presentation. You want to read that slide? Go back and read it. Here's this. This is from Field and Forest. This is one of my uh, recommended mushroom growing supply companies. Okay, it's a mom and pop organization. Oh, I wish I had a catalog. Oh, I do. Oh, it, it's, oh, and this this spawn is actually from them. This bag of spawn, and it doesn't matter. Whatever you're going to Google it if you if you want them. There there's like three companies that I recommend, and they they're in the resources. Don't feel that you got to take notes on this. But Field and Force is always my go-to because when I call them up, I, it's a I get one of the owners on the phone and they talk through it and they've been doing this for decades and they help me with whatever growing project that I have. I've talked to people who've taken this class afterwards who have also called them and gotten great service and, and support in, in what they're doing. So what do we have here? This is right from their website. And, and what this is illustrating is that typically you're going to choose a mushroom species that you want to grow. And then you have to find the best type of wood to put that mushroom species on. Or you're like, hey, uh, the neighbor just had some tree work and there's like, there's some sugar maples there. What could we grow in sugar maple? And you come over here to sugar maple and you're like, well, we could grow lion's mane is really good on it. Olive oystering, reshi is really good on it. Now I know we're only talking about three mushrooms today. We are talking about the intro mushrooms, the ones that anybody can grow. But then you're gonna probably wanna branch out to other types once you've had success. I would say grow shiitakes, grow oysters, grow wine caps, the three that we're going to talk about them today. Have a year or two of growing those first and having success before you jump to anything else because you want to dial in, you want to dial in your own, um, you want to, your own process and not mess things up with, by spending money on lots of experimental things. I'm going to teach you today how to, how to get them going without doing a lot of experiment to get it right the first time. Here's, so again, my point is that tables like this can kind of help you pair up wood species with the, with the best uh, mushroom that will decompose that. So again, we're going to talk about shiitakes, oysters, and wine caps aren't even on this list because this is a tree species list for logs and wine caps are not grown on logs. Okay, so what do we got? Okay, best time to source logs. Okay, so best time to source wood. Again, don't you like my little watercolors? This one's not the best, but you get the idea. Is that as we look at the wheel of time here, we have spring. This is the worst time to collect your, your wood species. So here's the thing. You might leave this class and be like, I'm gonna do it. So you might hunt down locally, talk to local tree trimming services and be like, hey, I'm looking for logs that might have been harvested over this winter that are oak logs. Do you have any that I could buy from you? And they, they likely have the piles of logs that they're saving for firewood. And you come along, you're like, yeah, you don't have to split it or anything like that. I'll take them in big old logs and you'll give them, a, 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 you know, pay them a bit and everything. They will be happy that they don't have to split those logs and find a home for them. They'll be happy to drop them off at your doorstep for a nominal fee. So if you're sourcing logs again, the reason you don't want to source them during right now, the spring through early summer, is because the trees are taking all of their reserve energy that they had through the winter and pumping it out into the buds, not in the wood tissue of the tree any longer, okay? So in the summer, the tree's photosynthesizing, it's packing away sugars, it's growing new, new, new limbs and everything, growing new leaves and Oh man, it's just growing, growing, growing. Then the fall comes along and what it starts to do is to, to, to pack away sugars and, and energy in the roots, in the wood tissue, all the way up and, and, and to pr preserve those throughout the whole winter months. That's why fall through winter is the best time to harvest. Um, the best time to harvest wood for mushroom growing projects that require that wood. Okay, now what I will say is that this doesn't necessarily hold true 
when we talk about wood chips. Okay, so I am talking about logs only with that. If you have a mushroom growing project that requires wood chips, pretty much wood chips from any time of the year are gonna be good enough because anything that's going to grow in wood chips is going to be vigorous enough to make it through um, it, no matter where, the, what stage of the life cycle the wood chips are. So I saw a chat, uh, this question in the chat, woo, with all the ash trees succumbing to the emerald ash borer, will the down ash logs be suitable for mushroom growing or do the beetles go? Okay, so so don't, uh, it, it wouldn't be that the beetles are consuming the good stuff in the tree. I like how you put that in, the, in quotes, the good stuff in the trees. Um, the It's more so how long has that tree been standing dead? Okay, so sourcing, sourcing wood, we definitely talk about this, but fine, the question's here, let's just address it now and then we'll skip over it later. In the whole timing of the trees, okay, a tree that is standing and it's alive and somebody cuts down with a chainsaw, what happens is that that tree was just alive and it had enzymes coursing through the cambium layer of that tree, the outer ring layer, the sapwood of the tree, not the heartwood, but the sapwood of the tree. And those enzymes are antifungal, antibacterial, antimicrobial. They are protecting the tree from getting infected. So when you initially cut down a tree or a tree trimming service has done so, or Asplint has come along to trim the trees near the power lines, Again, you're hearing where we sort, we can source trees very easily. You come by those Asplen folks, you know, that you guys have Asplen out there. A few yeses, noes, the big orange trucks, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we got them around our way. And so I drive by and I give them my card and I'm like, hey, you're working down the road for me. You got wood chips? I'll take them. Here's my card. Hey, you got, got some logs right there? My, I'm right down the road. You know, the one that, yeah, yeah, you're going to drop. Oh, you're going to leave them there. Okay, I'll come back later. You know, and so you just quick talk and they want to, you know, they want a place to dump the chips if they're not even if they can't leave them there. All right, coming back to a tree that's standing has antifungal enzymes in it. If I so here's one of my failures early on, I was really gung ho, really eager to like inoculate logs, and so I would find a tree on the side of the road that had just been cut, bring it home, and immediately that same day or same week, put fungi in it, put put the spores in it, and not the spores, but the fungal tissue in it. And the whole thing would fail because those enzymes in the tree tissue was were activated and killed, killed and stunted what I was what I was putting in to try and infect the log. And it was a complete failure. Never got mushrooms from those logs. Okay, so here's the here's the trick. If you're writing down things, you don't have to write these down. These are in my handouts. But if you're writing things down because it helps you learn, note taking is important. <laughs> so um, if you're writing things down, here's the general rule. During the winter, you don't need to worry about it because worry about the age of the logs because you're not going to put fungi in the logs in the winter. It's once you come out and it's like springtime, think like March and the ground has thawed. That's when the timer starts ticking and you need to get fungi in the log before it becomes too old and the native species get their way into the log. This is where the whole emerald ash borer thing comes in because how long has that tree been dead? If that tree has been dead for six months, the native fungi are already in the tree and it's not worth putting your fungi in the, in the tree in a, because the native fungi have already gotten in there, not the emerald ash borer, but you know, I, hope, I hope that's kind of ringing true there. So you can wait too long. All right, but that's, but not, not if, you know, again, the timer starts ticking either when you cut the tree down fresh throughout the, the regular growing season or in the winter once the, the ground thaws. Now, once you've cut the tree down, if it's, if the native fungi are kind of active and they could get in there, you want to wait two weeks from when it was harvested up to about six weeks. Could you push it to eight? Yeah, you could probably push it to eight but then you're risking that the native fungi are getting in there. If you stay within that, that's a whole month window you got there. If you stay within that two weeks from harvest to six weeks from harvest, you got a whole month to put your order in for the, for the, for the spawn, gather tools, call friends and family, email them, text them, whatever, and, and get people together to, to do a mushroom growing project. You got plenty of time to, to schedule that weekend project. And, and so, um, so it's a good thing to talk about the timing of things. Let's go back, back to the presentation. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. 
This thing has like 30 slides. He's only on slide eight. Yeah, it's okay. We'll, we'll make it. Okay, wine caps. We're jumping into it. This is the first one we're actually going to talk about growing. So, so, and this one's the easiest because you don't need to worry about timing of trees and you don't need to worry about, ah, it's like this one you're going to see it's wicked easy. This is a picture of a garden bed that I have right outside my house that has herbs and rhubarb and apple trees and um, my lilac bushes and, and all right, it's, it's a mixed thing. It's got lots of perennial stuff in there. It's all perennials. And so here's the, the general rule is that when you're planting perennials, you use wood chips. Okay. So I didn't go down to Home Depot or, and get the bagged wood chips that have the dye in them because I want to grow food in this. So, so if I'm growing mushrooms, which I'm going to eat, I'm not going to put, uh, I'm not going to use wood chips that have been treated with anything. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, and what we're going to get is little mushrooms that look like this wine caps. You can see that burgundy red um, uh, to the cap. That's why they're called wine caps. They're also called a strophoria or a king strophoria. Um, so this starts the conversation again, another illustration of mine of using the whole tree from top to bottom. Okay, so, so, and this is mostly for hardwood species. That little note is there because it is kind of true. We're, we're not talking about your softwoods like, um, like your pines or your hemlocks, your, oh, oh never cedar, never cedar trees, never um, fruit trees because the, the aromatics and the, they're very antifungal. Like if you have like apple tree trimmings or, or something or a cherry tree that had to come down, we're not gonna be using that. But the vast majority of hardwood species um, can be used all the way from the tips of the branches. Anything three inches or less can be chipped and you can grow wine caps on them. Anything that's in the limbs here that are three inches to eight inches or so can be cut into logs that are two feet or four feet long and done for log culture to grow oysters, shiitakes, and a whole bunch of other mushrooms on. And then the big diameter stuff can be used to make totems that just kind of stand on their own. They're cut into rings and then and inoculated and stacked. And then the stump itself, you can even grow mushrooms on because the stump, you know, in my illustration, I tried to capture here that the, that the tree underneath the ground is nearly just as big as it is above the ground. That one stump, when you inoculate it, taps into all of the resources that are buried underneath the ground. And it infects that and pulls water and nutrients that it's digesting from the wood tissue underground and uses that to have amazing fruitings at the top. But the, again, the unfortunate thing is that not everybody has trees that they're willing to cut down and they have a fresh stump. Remember, when we're talking about this, we want fresh, fresh, fresh within that two weeks to six weeks from getting cut down. However, with wood chips, we're not worried about the age so much. Here's the timeline I would put on wood chips within six months from when they have been chipped. You go beyond that, it's probably not gonna be the best, okay? And so, Wine caps can also be grown on straw. So we got a picture, a side-by-side -side picture of here of hay and straw. Now, not could you grow it on hay? Yes, but we are going to want to grow on straw or wood chips because straw does not have seeds in it. Straw comes from the byproducts of, of the wheat and, and rye, barley, oats, rice, millet, the grains industry. What happens is that these go through the combine, they get harvested, and the, the, the seeds get processed into the grains and the flours that we use and that we eat, or for, even for animal feed, and the stems and the leaves get processed into straw, which that's what we're using. Again, so this, the seeds are taken out. While that's not what happens with hay, hay is something that you don't want to use in your garden because you will be introducing weed seeds to it. First cut hay is full of weed seeds because it's the first cutting of the season. Um, it's the most available type of hay that you have, and you don't want it. However, the second cutting of hay, you know, so they cut this, they cut the hay in like June and then maybe July, August comes around and they can cut the hay a second time. It has fewer weed seeds. It's risky to use, but it's good. If, you, if that's what you have access to, maybe you could use that in your garden. The weed seeds are not a problem for the mushrooms, by the way. It's a problem because you'd be taking all of these grass seeds and planting them in your garden, thus creating a huge weed problem, which I've done. Learn from my failures. Don't use hay in your garden, use straw. If you can come across it, it's rare, it's hard to find, but a third cutting of hay is nearly 100% leaf. Yes, that is basically straw in itself, and, it's, and that's good enough to use. Okay, so this is what happens. This is that we infect the straw, and the straw 
ends up feeding. So the fungi eats the straw and then the worms eat the fungi. So I'm, I'm basically like kind of showing this to you because these garden beds can be used underneath as, as like mulch layers underneath the, the other things that you're growing in your regular garden. So you could lay down cardboard if you want, or you could just go with straw. It depends if you're starting from scratch. I guess this is the part where I say, um, if, if where I say that there is there's a ton to um, there's a ton to go over, and I do actually have a version of this class that's that's like actually like it's a four hour version of this class. If you're interested, I've got the recording for it. What you'd see is that we dive deeper into each of these topics. So I'm gonna about, I'm gonna give you the the down and dirty on how to grow wine caps. There is more to it and how it can be used. And the, it also pairs up with my no-till gardening class. Again, not to like market another class, but like it, the, I, it can't hurt to mention it. If you're in the like mind of like growing mushrooms in your garden, you might be of the like mind to also like the no-till gardening method where you where you basically use this, this same method of growing mushrooms, but to have a weed-free garden that has a lot of organic fertility naturally built into it. So let's go back to the presentation. Da, 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 da. What is so? What does this look like? So so yeah yeah yeah. You you got these straw beds blah blah. So if you're gonna lay down cardboard as a weed barrier or anything like that, you do that. We've got Amazon boxes all over the place, and you're literally taking this bag of like sawdust spawn that's infected with the fungal tissue, and you're sprinkling the spawn over that cardboard or whatever, and then laying down wood chips or straw on top of it. Okay, and now th there's got to be a critical amount of it, like four or six inches of it. Now, when I say four or six inches, I mean four or six inches that, you know what, you put it on and six inches high and then three weeks go by and it's compacted down to four. That's what you want is the compacted um, amount to be at least four inches, which means you might have to go a little bit bigger. With straw, it's a little bit the opposite because straw, when you unbale it, and then it gets wet, it kind of rehydrates with water and, and gets a little thicker, just a little bit thicker. So you might be able to put down three inches of straw knowing that it's gonna to go to four. Um, I'm just gonna quickly show you, this is how I transformed my garden into a no-till garden and then grew mushrooms on it. Spread out some compost, got some big old bales of straw, bigger than you'd probably even like care to get. Um, I teach a class on soil blocks and, grow, grow, and seed starting success and stuff like that. But I, I get those ready. And, and in the summer, this is what it looks like is mushrooms growing at the base of my tomato plants at the base of my zucchini plants. And all I'm doing is taking back, uh, you know, I can, I can start and inoculate my garden, which is about 30 feet by 50 feet and inoculate it with just probably four bags, one of these bags in each corner. And the fungi throughout the course of the summer will infect the straw through and through. What you're seeing here is I have pulled back the straw. So here's the thing, we're short on time. And at the very end of this presentation is a video. If you want like, if you want to watch the video of me actually like spreading out, spreading out the stuff, you can watch the video. It's literally as simple as having one of these bags that cost about, eh, I think it's like 20 bucks. Everything's about 20 bucks these days, right? All right, so anyway. A bag of, of spawn like this. This is sawdust that's been infected by the company um, with, with a fungal tissue. This one happens to be shiitake. So would I use this in the garden? No, I would I would go to their online you know, catalog and hunt down wine caps. And then I break this up and it turns kind of back into a uh, mm, like a wet sawdust uh, consistency and sprinkle it over. It really is that simple. And then you're taking the straw that was on top, putting it back on top of it and watering the whole thing down because you don't wanna put dry straw on top of it and just leave it dry. All that dry straw will pull the moisture away from the fungi and stunt it. It might not like kill it, but it'll put it into a dormant state. So typically I look at the weather and I do this either the day of or the day before it's going to rain. And I, I get it all set up, put the straw back on top of the, uh, of the stuff and then water it myself, knowing that rain is gonna really soak it the next day. It's a great spring project. So if you leave this class, again, at the end of the presentation, there's, there's a, like I said, and on my YouTube channel, there's a video all about, about that. Um, here, let's see, we are on slide, slide 16. That video, a link to this video is on slide 38 
um, all the way at the end, but it's also in the handouts. Uh, again, you're going to have like way more things to dive into after this. Slide 16, we got to keep hauling. Okay, so there is more to learn about wine caps, but I, I'm going to move on. Like I said, there, like I've got a more advanced class if you're really into it. And plus, you can find out more about these things, but you get the basics. Wine caps can be used in, in straw or wood chip beds. The same method that we're talking about for wood chips can be used for straw. It's the same thing. Um, and I use them in my like forest garden. So like in my front yard, I've got orchard trees planted and I've got wood chips underneath those orchard trees in lines. So I can just mow in lines and, and I've got mushrooms growing underneath those trees. Also adding fertility to the area under the trees. Okay, so we're talking about another type of mushroom, oyster mushrooms. Okay, so, so this is my son standing next to a totem right here. That's from a couple of years ago. And um, this is a totem that somebody from my, one of my classes, um, I forget when I got this picture, I think it was just like recently, like last year, they, um, they were like, hey, we just took your class. And, and I used to sell spawn in the live classes that we do. And people would like buy the spawn after the class and go do a project. Um, and, and they had left the class and had logs ready to go. And they, they did this project and look at that, like, look at how many meals of like, of like oyster mushrooms they got from this. And that's the first fruiting of this. Totems are great, a great use of, of large diameter logs. And so all of our rules with gathering the logs kind of check in right now, the timing of the year and the timing of harvesting them. But um, these are going to be for logs that you're really not going to want to move around. You're going to want to find a place to put them, a nice shady place, not swampy, shady. Um, and why shady? Just because you don't want the sun and the, you know, the sun, the wind, whatever, to pull moisture away from the log. Um, that's, a, that's a big way in, in which they fail. And here's, huh, let's see, do we have time to jump into cardboard spawn? We, we kind of don't. So I, I, this beautiful little picture here, I am going to leave it in that cardboard spawn is something just like how this log was in a Rubbermaid tote in the, you know, in my basement and, and started to grow fungi on it because it was infected. You can basically do the same method of, of uh, starting, starting wood chips and straw, but with cardboard. And it's like, why would you do this here? This is an optional stage. If you're the type of person that doesn't necessarily want to get a chainsaw, maybe you want to have somebody else cut the logs up for you, uh, or maybe you want to take that bag of spawn and make it expand and become 10 times as big as it was. Well, you gather up your Amazon boxes, you follow this process of creating a lasagna of sprinkling stuff, and you create your own cardboard, cardboard spawn that you could then shove into cracks in the totems. Or you could take this, the slices of the logs and stack them with cardboard. This is, of course, exaggerated. Would you leave the cardboard hanging out like that? No, you get scissors and you trim it. Um, and so this would be infected cardboard. That's why I used the gold glitter the watercolor paint on it. It's because it's not just cardboard. It's infected cardboard with, with, the, with like an oyster string. Um, so you could have like cuts from a chainsaw and, and get the same result. Um, However, we're going to talk about making totems just with handfuls of, of spawn. So this is a, a picture that I made um, early on. This was, oh yeah, the watercolor paint for this was a different, this was a handmade watercolor pigment paint. Um, uh, I, I really, yeah, whatever. I remember this one because it was a real gritty paint to work with and it didn't flow. Not like, not like the, uh, like how this blends. Oh my God, you're not getting a watercolor lesson. Let's jump back to this. Um, so anyway, Making totems really is pretty straightforward in that you're going to start with a log that's eight inches or more in diameter, and you're going to be cutting it into a few rounds. How big are those rounds? Well, they're about, you know, eight inches, maybe 16 inches. Why don't you want them so big? Well, the bigger the section is, the more of a gap there is in between where you're putting the spawn. And so what is it? You want a big old handful of spawn. You can reach into that bag, take a handful of spawn. And here's what you do is you put the first handful of spawn on the ground on a piece of cardboard, okay? And that keeps it from being in direct contact. Now, if you're gonna use a, a plastic bag for this, like, let's back up, like the person who took this class, sorry, the person who took this class, you see how there's a plastic bag down there. 
they thought ahead. And so they put the bag down first, then they put the spawn down, and then they put their first layer of log on top. Then they put another layer of spawn, handful of spawn on top of this, spread it out like a pancake, and then put this other section of log on top. And they went 16 inches at least. And then they put a cap on top of it. And, and it looks like they, like the, I did, stapled like paper bags at the top, but then wrapped up and to, picked up that garbage bag and put it over the whole structure. So as we go back to this illustration, what you're going to do is protect this whole thing with something that's going to stop it from getting all the water wicked away from it. So a garbage bag is an excellent thing to use. If you don't like plastic, you can do what I do, which is cardboard on the bottom. And then I gather my paper bags. I slice open the paper bags, just like how you used to cover your textbooks a long time ago. Slice open the paper bags. And then I use a stapler, a carpet stapler, and I staple the bags as just a paper layer around this. And then really, it's like it, you, you basically keep an eye on this. And when, it, when it's fully colonized, it will look like a fuzzy log, like this log here. It'll have fuzzy spots sticking out and that's fully colonized. And that's when you can take the plastic, take the paper off of it and it will naturally fruit when it wants to. Um, so yeah, again, I, did, I wasn't sure if I had this picture. You can see the customer here. Um, this other person who took my class had a layer of cardboard on top. Looks like they kind of have maybe bricks on top to hold it down and to hold the plastic here. This is an excellent example of a full colonization pre um but right before it fruits okay so so from this point this was actually this winter they unwrapped it and to check on it they were like hey is everything looking okay i was like oh my god it looks perfect you can leave the plastic bag off because when you see this what that means is that the fungi have penetrated the wood through and through and it will it will outcompete the native fungi um and you have a perfect colonization and you're going to get harvests like this um don't have time to talk about micro remediation so i'm going to leave that part out all right whoo we've been doing a lot i've been doing i need a little drink i'm looking to chat see if there's any any questions no questions feel free to i know i talk a lot but like you can pause and ask questions in the chat don't you want to be in my eighth grade class so what we're going to talk about now is log culture drilling logs and stuff like that just like this to get to get a full colonization while i have this prop okay this is where you might want to make me as big as you can make me here all right so you can see things as i roll this log over okay so these are little caps we'll talk about those but then we're like right here you see you see that little thing poking up that's the little primordial head of the little mushroom that's just starting to trigger right there look at that look at that it's still in focus that's pretty good all right, and then you get my creepy eyes behind. There's there's a screenshot for you. Um, so here here's what you'll also see. This one right here. Uh, that one, you see that brown one right there? Okay, so that is a mushroom that started the fruit last winter. Okay, so what was the timeline on this lot? I started this project, this particular batch, last, I don't know, I'd have to check my, check my Instagram. I think it was like May or June. It's always May or June when I'm doing mushroom stuff. I gather the, the logs, uh, you know, May or June. Dogs running around. That distracted me. Now I'm in the distracted phase of getting tired. Okay, but anyway, so why am I pointing this out? This mushroom that never grew and capped and everything is a good sign because once it's fruiting, and it's attempting the fruit. I know that the entire log is colonized and I don't have to worry about it. This can just be out in nature and it will fruit like right now when the temperature and moisture conditions are ideal and it's gonna start to fruit. So, and that's what I'm actually seeing with this. Um, so my point is, is once you see a mushroom that started to, you can be proud and happy and be like, it's working, yay! And it, now it means that the life cycle for that for that whole log is now going to be several years long of fruiting and success um, and monitoring it. What else we got? Books? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, we'll go back. We'll go back. Freezing day. All right. Is there any way to promote chicken of the woods mushrooms that are growing? Uh, should you ever cut the grow old growth back? Um, you don't have to worry about cutting the old growth back. The actual like the native little critters and stuff, they'll clean that up. Um, typically, and it'll just refruit from that same spot. So, chicken of the woods is an awesome one. 
let's see, actually on the cover of this book, look at that chicken of the woods. It's it's big. It's orange. You can't miss it with when it's in the woods. Um, there's like there's very few lookalikes. So it is um, no no surprise that um, Amelia is asking about it uh, because it's a very popular mushroom to identify and to know that it's safe to eat. And it's it's one of the uh, hmm, what's that word? Whatever the gateway mushrooms of the mushroom hunting thing. You know to put a positive spin on those uh, on that phrase. Anyway, you asked, should you cut the growth back? It's going to keep fruiting from that same spot. In fact, I have a tree where, where the tree's been standing dead from the gypsy moths that came through a few years ago. And just this year, the treetop flew off, landed on the ground, and it's growing chicken of the woods on the ground. It was growing in the treetop, like 40 feet up, but the wind knocked it down. Now it's growing on the log sections that fell on the ground. And here's the other thing is that now I know that the rest of that tree, I'm going to go down with a chainsaw. I'm going to cut the rest of that tree down so that the rest of the tree can be on the ground and I can harvest chicken of the woods right on the right at ground level. Now that's on our property. So I, I'm able to do that. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. So log culture. Okay. Okay. Oh, so these are pictures of pictures of shiitake mushrooms again we've talked about we've talked about wine caps grown in straw and wood chips we've talked about oysters now oysters can be grown in logs like this as well um but oysters can also be grown in, on the totems like we saw shiitake is just my note is that we're going to talk about log culture but you can also grow them in totems the other form of log culture um so you get my artsy fartsy little picture there of the shiitake and the sunset and uh and yeah this is what fruiting looks like with shiitakes um here's what i will say is that do not get hung up on the marketing of like i did of the marketing within these catalogs and be like uh, and be like where are we here sorry and you're, you're like oh well those shiitakes look different oh those look pretty oh and that's got a different pattern on no don't get hung up on the patterns or anything because all shiitake mushrooms look the same in in the same growing conditions um even even though i might look at these and see that these might be darker than these that are lighter brown mm -mm -mm. They, they're they so so what's a way to think about it the the growing conditions that once the fungi once the mushroom pops out the humidity the temperature and the amount of light it gets determines its shape how how craggly its skin will be how um how big it'll even get and and how smooth its skin will be the texture of it and 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 everything so so here's the thing is that like don't get hung up on on the marketing the the marketing of different strains are going to be like well i want a warm weather one and a cool weather one because i want some diversity in when they're going to fruit or you know what i only want the cool weather ones because i kind of want all my mushrooms to pop all at once so i can process them all at once um typically a lot of people like just get into lots of different varieties um don't worry i'm mentioning some things that you'll warm weather cool weather don't worry don't worry about it um pretty much all shiitake are are going to be successful um and don't worry about warm weather or cool weather at this point unless you like wanted to take an advanced version of this okay so the ends of the log again this is what we're looking for we're hoping that fungi works its way right to the ends of the log um remember that mushroom life cycle that's what we're trying to get is that full colonization and so i love this picture oh, i just I, I actually forget which watercolor palette i used for this one but i love the colors anyway this is the drill and fill method, which again, on the last, uh, not the last slide, but the you know first to last slide at the end of this presentation, I actually have a video of me drilling logs. You don't have to watch it now because you can watch it later on YouTube. Okay, let's let's get to it. Um, the drilling method, this is again, using the, the smaller diameter logs um, that you can move around. You definitely need to soak the logs. So remember, all of those timing things kick in again. You got to wait two to six weeks from when the logs were harvested from the tree to let the enzymes die out, but not let the native fungi get in. So these details are going to kind of matter once you start getting in the log culture. So those logs have been sitting around for weeks, drying out. You need to soak those logs 
so that they have a lot of moisture in them. And so you can do that in buckets or in a wheelbarrow, or you can do like I do. And you can take, I have pictures later on, don't worry, of me converting my trailer into a wash tub um, with plastic. I line it with plastic, fill it up with water and take all sorts of safety precaution. Keep it hooked up to a vehicle for 12 to 24 hours while it's soaking. And then be careful, create a sluice gate so you can carefully release the water from this, not drop the, the tailgate because that can have all of the logs floating out on top of you. And that's a bad situation. I've never done that, but I've, I've watched it happen with me off to the side going, wow, I'm glad I'm over here. Um, as all of the logs and water float out because I just opened the tailgate. Bad idea. Don't do it. Um, and again, wheel chalks, all that safety stuff, keeping kids away from it just in case it doesn't hold its weight, blah, blah, blah. All right. So it is drill. You drill the logs out. We'll look at what that looks like. You fill them with the sawdust spawn. We'll look at the specialty tools that go with that. And then wax. I really should update this. I should have the word cap here. And so what I'm illustrating here is that you could have three different people doing different jobs if you have them. When I do this, I am one person and I do all three jobs. I do, I have one log where I drill it, then I immediately fill that same log and then I wax them. I, I, don't, I don't drill a bunch of logs, then fill a bunch of logs, then I do one log at a time so, um, so that I'm controlling my variables here. Now waxing really should be called capping. And that's what I have on my logs here are little styrofoam caps that I've now used instead of wax. But then you set the logs aside and you got your spawn run. Um, so here's what um, the drill pattern looks like. I love this one. I don't know. I just love the colors. It's me. I'm happy. Um, this one makes me smile. So it's just like ah, this rainbow log here. So the drill pattern is one that you're going to drill, you know, every few inches. Here's the here's the temptation. There's always a temptation of somebody new getting into this to be like, well, you know, I paid a lot of money for this spawn and I want to make it go long. So what if I drill them a little further apart? Well, if you're drilling them further apart and spreading that spawn too thin, it's not going to be as vigorous of a, a growing uh, situation there. It's, it's not, it's not going to be able to outcompete the native fungi and it's going to be more likely to fail. Don't do that. Stick to these patterns of doing a whole row and drilling them um, drilling them about six inches apart. And then you turn the log a bit and drill the next row, staggering the drill holes a couple inches over part. And then again, six inches, six inches, six inches. Okay. And so why are the logs, by the way, why are the logs this size and this size? Because the drill, the drill and fill method is one where you're picking these logs up. Can you make a log that's six foot long and eight inches in diameter? Yeah, but why would you want to do that? You're going to have to pick that log up and move it and turn it. Don't do that. All right. Would we, could we cut them to shorter lengths? Yes, but you're not going to have a critical mass um, and everything. So you want something that, that's a nice, a nice amount of mass, uh, biomass. Okay. And so this is what my trailer looks like when I turn it into a little pond. Okay. You can see I've lined it with plastic, filled it with water and logs. And, you know, typically you, know, you should attach it to, uh, to a vehicle. I, well, you know, was not as smart and I chalked it up back here. So I have this, this picture here as a point of don't do this. Don't do what I did here. Always leave it attached to a vehicle and locked on so that this trailer can't um, fail and tip and fall on anybody if you're going to do that method if you're going to work with a lot. So not everybody's going to do this, but people really get into this. You're learning like a really fun way of making a lot of logs. And, and I, I don't mind teaching you this because here, here's the thing is that I sell these logs locally to, to folks um, for $30 a piece. Okay. And so you're welcome to drive out to my farm, and pick them up. Um, you know, if you want something that's ready to go and they're going to fruit and be guaranteed the fruit, you're out in the other side of the state. If you, if you want to get into like, and, and have this, like pay for it for yourself, go ahead market the logs locally for yourself. You just heard my dollar amount. Um, and, and once you've got yours dialed in and you know, they're going to fruit, like I know mine will fruit and I can guarantee a, a specific product. Um, then, then you can do that. Why was I saying this? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it was with uh, the volume. Why would you want to do a whole bunch of logs? Well, maybe you want to have it as a side business. Maybe you want to do it or something where like you want to feed the community, maybe donate the logs to a local, like, you know, food pantry or something like that, where they could literally be harvested on the day right before people walk through the food pantry. I don't know. Um, or, 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 or whatever. There's lots of different things that could be done. Maybe you're part of a garden club and the whole club wants to get together, do this job, invest in the tools one once as a kit for the garden club and then anybody could use it and then um and and then the, after the day when everybody's done the project everybody gets to go home with a log 
and you've done it, you know, you've done a whole trailer load. You can do this with smaller amounts of logs, but that I'm, I'm telling you why you might do it in a larger amount. Okay. So, oops, sorry, showing you other stuff. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just what some of my infrastructure kind of looks like now. You can see how I, I kind of now I work from my, from my trailer, taking the logs, letting them roll down this. And this is, I intentionally shot this picture with an, an exaggeration on slope here so that you could see I'm working with a gradual slope here so that the gravity is always helping me roll the logs down gently. And then I can roll them down the hill to where they're going to be stacked. I'm using gravity. That's why you're taking this class. So you, you get the little tips and tricks of like little things that you can make, save money, save your back. Um, so something like this, like saw horses and rolling them along onto like a little wheeled thing. Now, now some of the specialty tools. So with the wine caps in straw and wood chips, no tools, easy. You know, all you need is a pair of scissors to open up the bag of spawn. Um, with the, with the uh, oysters on totems, yeah, you're going to need somebody with a chainsaw or you with a chainsaw, chainsaw safety. I cut my leg with a chainsaw once. So um, yeah, yeah, make sure you, whoever's holding it knows what they're doing. Well, I didn't initially. Now I do know how to use a chainsaw safely. Here's some specialty tools though. We're finally in the last stage of learning something kind of cool and, and specialty tools. So you, this, these really are must-haves. If you're going to make 20 logs, which which one, one of these bags of spawn, sawdust spawn will do about 20 logs. It'll really do about 25, but it's safe to say 20 logs, okay? And so, so um, and what does 20 logs look like? It looks like one, I might have a picture. It, it looks like uh, this. That's about a stack of about 20 logs, okay? And so it may not even look like a lot. Look at this. This is gardening where you're growing a protein source and it takes up a four foot by four foot area and you're growing something that's like healthy and right in your own backyard. Here's the thing. So there are these special bits. And again, Field and Forest has them. There's other places that have them stick with one company and buy all of the tools and stuff from that one company because they will work together. Do not go to Amazon and buy any of these tools. I actually really am saying that uh, wholeheartedly because some of these tools you can find on Amazon, but you can't find the other ones and then they do not pair well together. And honestly, you are not saving any money by buying them on Amazon. Go direct to Field and Forest. They have, they are the premier company, you know, local company in, in the United States that has the, the precision tools. So a drill bit like this is a high speed drill bit. That, it's an auger that pulls out the, 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 again, you can watch me, the YouTube me drilling with this in a flash. It drills the hole because it has a, um, a self tapping, it pulls itself in with the screw into the wood, cores it out, and then has a stopper so that you don't go too far deep. Um, you could drill and use wooden dowels. You might see some of these out there. However, um, the wooden dowels, they, it's you're not going to get the biggest bang for your buck, um, meaning they are going to be more per log. They are, let's see. they're somewhere in the range of five to 10 times more expensive to use. Why are you paying for maybe wooden dowels that are infected instead of sawdust spawn that's infected with, um, is for the convenience that maybe you don't need some specialty tools. But I'm telling you, if you're really getting into this, you're gonna want the little tools. So there's a tool that takes the sawdust and makes it into a core sample that you push into the hole. Um, I'll show you what that, what that tool looks like. And, and then this is what a stack could look like. Now. Best practices, you do not wax the ends of the logs like I did here. All you need to do is cap over the ends here with, where, the, where those are. Um, this is my setup now for working with logs is that I got my little John Deere tractor and I could do like 10 logs in that like little, little um, trailer right there, roll them down here and inoculate them with my little tool, not with this drill, but with a, a different drill, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, so I'm going to show you the tools in just a second, but I want you to show this is what full colonization looks like. So this is a cross section of a log that has fruited recently. And so what you see here is you see, do I have close ups? Yeah, look at this close up of a drill hole. There's the cap was here and the sawdust penetrates into the softwood. And so what we're doing is we are giving it access. We are giving the fungi access to all of these layers and it moves horizontally through these layers, infecting and reconnecting with the other drill holes. This was a 
this was an accidental find. I, I was cutting the log so I could ship it to somebody because um, I do that. And, um, and I was cutting off just the end of the log so it would fit in the box. And I found this beautiful pattern. And so what you're seeing is that it infects that outer ring of the, and works its way toward the center. And so this is what full colonization looks like. The fungi from this connected with the fungi over here, connected with the fungi over here, and they are rotting the log eating it and then getting ready to fruit. Just love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Just, yeah, me taking all these pictures of these cores, you know, where that sawdust spawn was in. Cause this was just like serendipity that I happened to cut right on those lines. Now, I, again, I'm promised we're gonna come back to the tools, but I just wanted to hit these slides. So one thing that you can do with log culture, this might be the, um, the, the why, why would I do, do, do these logs is that you shiitake mushrooms are the only ones that we know of, that we can force them to fruit. Now, what that means is that the logs will naturally fruit in the fall and in the, excuse me, in the fall and in the spring, when the temperature is kind of in the 50s and you got lots of rain and stuff. But in the summer, they go dormant and they never fruit throughout the whole summer. However, you can trick them. And that's where we'll go back to the presentation. You can trigger them to fruit in the summer. And that's why, that's why, not because people are going to want to sell these logs, but that's why you might want to get shiitakes and learn how to do log culture because you can have mushrooms from spring through summer through fall on a schedule because you can force them to fruit and then a week later harvest them and then take another log and force it to fruit that, you know, you know, activate it one week and get force it to fruit the next week. And this is how people are bringing mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms to the farmer's market and to restaurants at a regular clip is by learning how to force them to fruit. So as we go back to my, I'm proud of these illustrations. This one, this one's gotta be the one I'm most proud of because it's the most like graphic-y, graphic novel-y. Um, and I'd love to be like a cartoon, like illustrator, um, but, it, it, which, but I'm not good at characters. Anyway, here's my little character, the log. You want it, so a fully colonized log. Remember, it is fully colonized. You started to see, oh, little mushrooms are starting to pop out of this. And then the summer has come. Now you can take that log that is fully colonized and soak it in cool water for 12 to 24 hours. That water does have to be significantly colder than the air temperature. So if it's 80 degrees, you need water temperature that's at least 30 degrees less, at least 50 or lower, which if you are out in the, out in the sticks like I am and you've got um, you know well water, that's cold enough. Okay, so you let it soak in a bucket, one end, flip it over on the other end, whatever. And then you, you pull it out after 12 to 24 hours and you hit it with sledgehammer on once one end once and then on the other end, another time. And then you wait seven days because what you did is you gave it the water that it needed to fruit. And then you stressed it like pruning a plant and it triggers the fruiting. And then seven days later, I kind of went light on this. The log will be covered in mushrooms, like some of the best pictures that I had way back. Um, and you are harvesting them seven days later and you can soak the next log for the next week. Um, and so here's the thing is that this log needs to rest for six to eight weeks before you can soak it and trigger it again. So if you think about it, if you have eight logs, you can soak one log one week, harvest the next and soak the log for the next week that day harvest it the next week. And then by the time you've gone eight weeks through, you've cycled through all the logs and now you can start re-soaking and triggering the first log in the whole thing. This is amazing, it's mind blowing. So um, yeah, so, so what did I wanna show you? I wanna show you some of the tools for log culture that are must haves. Again, we're not gonna cheap out on this. We're gonna, if you're gonna go the log culture route, it's, it's pool your money with other people who are interested in this. Um, you know, maybe, you know, I do have like a mushroom growing group on Facebook, which I'm trying to like encourage people to join, not, not for anything other than, hey, these are other people who are in Connecticut who want to grow mushrooms and maybe you guys can pool your resources together. Here's, here's, you know, and so by joining the group, you'd have a pool of other people who already took my class who want to grow mushrooms. And so you could pull together and maybe borrow tools from one another. Okay. So this is, I'm having trouble seeing myself. I do want to can I pin myself? Sorry. Oh, there we go. I'm pinning my own face so I can, so I can make sure that I get good quality. So, so this is just a regular angle grinder. Okay. This is, this is made for high speed, high torque. This is made for grinding metal. So it's very powerful tool. Now you can pick these up 
for cheap at Ocean State Job Lot. You can pick up the lower powered ones there. You can pick them up at a pawn shop. That's actually where I, or I, I got my other one to replace this one. So this one became my dedicated tool. And so again, Field and Forest, they got all these things. They have one where it's like a whole kit. I think it's like $120, $130 the bit, the, the whole thing ready to go. But you can piece this together. This is a, is a special little adapter that goes on the end of the angle grinder. So these two things are kind of like proprietary specialty tools. This is not too special. You can find these anywhere. That's what I'm saying. These, this is made for high speed drilling and this is made for high speed drilling and they are made to lock together while, while you're coring out these. And so here's the thing is that, you know, Safety, of course, this is fast. If it hits your hand, it's pulling itself into your hand before you can even have a chance to take it out. So this is always a two-handed operation where you are always of um, uh, an alert mind, okay? But it's, it's still super fast. Again, I got a picture of me, not a picture, a video of me just drilling. It's just like, and it's fast. Okay, so the specialty drills. Now this augurs out a hole that matches up with a tool that fills that hole, okay? So the specialty tools for filling holes, they could be, now when I do this with my kids at school, everybody gets a little tray, they get some sawdust spawn in there from the bag and it's all broken up and I give some kids, give some kids the funnel. So they fill their funnel up and they go to each hole and they shove the spawn in with the dowel. This is a stupid way of doing it, by the way. But I love giving like eight, eight kids a sets of these and they're filling their logs. Good job guys, good job. And then I come up to one kid and I'm like, hey, here. And then everybody's like, well, I, I want that tool. And so, so, okay, probably $30, $35 in that range. This tool is going to last forever. Okay, now there are two that you have to choose from. Do not buy this one. How are they different? Look at that. This one's meant for two-handed operation and palming. However, the spring that's inside this is so stiff. I don't know why they're doing that. They really need to re-engineer it. <gasps> I'm going to reach out to them. I'm going to tell them. Because I just emailed them about another product and they, they said that they were actually going to do it. Anyway, I don't have a pencil. All right, anyway. Um, look at this. This one can be done two handed if you really need to, but this one is the thumb inoculator, meaning it's easy enough to do with the thumbs. Now, I know, you know, if, if we're getting arthritic and stuff like that and you need to turn it into a two handed oper operation, no big deal because it's a super soft spring. Anyway, this is what creates that little core sample that fills the log. So, you know, tap, tap, and, and it really is like a chicken. Tap, tap, tap. We're not doing, really packing it in there. We want a nice loose pack so that all of that spawn gently goes into the hole. Then, um, then what you're doing after that is you're, you need to cap it over. So you can get regular um, like candle makers, wax flakes, something like that, and a dedicated like, double boiler system man you gotta look that up double boiler and then stuff that's used for wax for putting it on the rule for wax is that if it's hot enough to burn you it's hot enough to kill the fungi mm. so you can see why i've moved away from wax and i've really jumped in on this and this is the product that i told field and force they should do because they make this 400 dollar tool now you ain't gonna pay 400 dollars for this tool but this tool has these little styrofoam caps that these caps, you know, feed through like a little, you know, like a little. So this, I go tap, 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 fills, fills the hole. And then in one fell swoop also caps it with one of these little styrofoam caps. The purpose of the cap is to stop native fungi and molds and spores and stuff like that from attacking what you just put in there and to preserve its moisture. And this little bit of styrofoam does it. Now, I know you may not like styrofoam and stuff like that. So then you're going to learn the wax method. It's, it's a mess, but the styrofoam cap thing, what I told Field and Forest was like, can you please offer these not in crate sizes? Like I buy, I buy them in a big old crate and spend 60 bucks for a big box of them. Can you offer them in smaller packages that would be perfect for, you know, honestly, just like a little handful of these is gonna be perfect for a whole bag of this. Could you sell in there? That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna start offering these in smaller packages. It'll probably be like a next year item. Okay, anyway, so so really, there aren't a lot of crazy tools for log culture. You need a specialty drill that's gonna work at high speeds because if you're drilling lots of logs, even a corded hand drill won't be able to like 
really keep up with. It's just going to be so slow um, compared to the specialty of an angle grinder with that adapter. I'm, I'm, you're taking this to get all the tips and tricks um, for, for these things. And, and it really is a dedicated tool that, that's worth it. That's why you can hear me kind of saying, like, maybe you get together with other folks and you create a kit. You pull your money together. And, and for a couple hundred dollars, you can really, for less than $200, you can get each of the tools, even copies of the common tools like this, maybe two or three of these, and the angle grinder thing, and be set to go. All right, questions. Let's see. Can you... Can you get them already done? I'm not sure. I think I missed the timing on that question. Feel free to elaborate. Oh, somebody maybe put in the website of like my logs or whatever. Uh, um, can you dehydrate your fresh? Yes, that's that's my favorite thing to do with shiitakes. Besides eating them fresh, saute up with garlic and butter. Boom, they're, they're awesome fresh. Uh, or like in a risotto, oh man. But one of my favorite things to do is to dehydrate the shiitakes that I have that are extra stems and all and everything and then food process them into a powder and then put them in the freezer so i've taken all the moisture out of them i powdered them and now i can use them in cooking and and just sprinkle them on anything and it adds that that like deep flavor that umami flavor to everything without like any weird textures so yes you can dehydrate them you can freeze them if you leave them whole dehydrated or frozen it's gonna the texture is always gonna be a little off you know that you dehydrate an apple you can't ever make that apple like back the way it used to be that's how dehydration works but um but you're going to preserve the flavor on um, the freshness do you have any of these logs for sale oh yeah my site yeah and like i said 30 bucks or whatever um and, and i do offer discounts for six or more logs because then you could get into doing other crazy things so we're right towards the end i want to just go back to the presentation see if i missed anything Whew, i told you i could talk right I told you so Bum, 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 bum. Oh yeah. So my point at the end here is that you've learned a lot now. You've learned how to do some log cultures, some totems. The same method of drill and fill that you would use for logs, you would do as a drilling method for, for stumps, if you happen to have a stump. Um, the same method for drilling logs. You can then apply it to many other medicinal and, and edible fungi for growing them, but they part of their instructions might be like, well, the logs have to be buried. And so those are future things, future adventures for you to have. We've learned how to grow mushrooms in straw or wood chip beds using wine caps um, and, and to grow them all on their own or underneath the canopy of plants. We've, we've gotten all of these awesome things. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read through all of these because we're right towards the end, but these are some of my failures that I've had so that you can learn from them, you know? And like I said, at the very end, here's a video of me drilling out these logs. Look at that, it's nine minute video. If you want nine more minutes of this guy, there you go. You want six minutes and 50, almost seven more minutes of me showing you the wine cap thing? Go ahead, that's what you're watching on YouTube later um and that's it that is that's the end for for me besides questions that was excellent i i i was on the edge of my seat the whole time my goodness gracious you did a fantastic job mark i just really Excellent. thought that was fantastic um we do have a question in chat though there's a question in there um i think you covered this maybe earlier but maybe i'm not getting the question the best time to get the logs um I know you talked about spring and fall. So, so the time to source the logs um, would be would be pretty much any time except for when the trees are putting out their buds and they fully leaf out. Once we get to like July is what I'd say, maybe June, but July you could start harvesting trees again in July for maybe fall inoculation. Um, for the most part, I'll be honest. You know, some some people ask like, when's the best time to do this class? It really doesn't matter because what you can see is that from the class, you can leave this class with ideas of projects that you can do at any time of the year. Um, you're in the winter, you can be sourcing, you know, sourcing stuff. In the spring, you could be doing your wine cap beds and your vegetable gardens or your your perennial beds. Um, and then in the in the summer, again, you can start sourcing again and getting ready to inoculate stuff in the fall. Um, fall and spring are great times to start the mushroom projects. All the other times are great times to source things and get things lined up. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Could I, go ahead, go ahead. Um, buy, could I buy the um, logs or 
done up so I won't even have to do the project myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. See. If you're willing to drive out to Colchester, Connecticut, um, you, you know, you can save money on shipping and pick up a bunch of logs that way. Um, yes, I do have logs for sale and I, um, and I do ship them. Um, the logs are $20 a piece or $30 a piece and shipping is going to be about 20 or 15 each. Uh, what's the, what's the one logs that you mentioned that mm -hmm. you can have mushrooms for, you know, like the whole year. So that would be shiitakes. Shiitakes are the ones where, okay. um, you're getting, you can do the soak and strike method. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I, that's what I would prefer. Yeah. No, it's, it's, okay. it's crazy. It's crazy. And do you have, do you have the, where, where I can get them or, or say if I say. If oh, my farm. Okay. So I don't, I really don't know other people who sell them. Okay. So, but, but like literally <laughs> this guy, uh, out in okay. culture, Connecticut. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. You guys are going to have to take a road trip out to Colchester. That's all there is to it. Um, yeah. So I don't know if anybody else has a question, but I had a question as you were going along. Um, I was thinking about the um, shady places in my backyard. And I realized because I've got a lot of swamp, we can't have swamp, but we need shade. So my shady spots are all underneath pine trees. Mm -hmm. are, are pine needles and pine and acidic and all of that an okay spot to do this project? Uh, or, yes, no. So, so when I mean swampy, I mean, we don't want the logs sitting in the swampy water. Could you put a pallet? Could you put something up there to keep them out of it? Yeah, that's going to be fine. Okay. We just don't want them like sitting in water because what you'll then be doing is creating an environment for just other fungi to, that would love that environment. While ours are used to a dead tree falling in the woods and just sitting on the surface of the woods. So that's the, the environment that we're trying to mimic the dappled sunlight of the woods where that tree had fallen. And so similarly, um, it's not necessarily the soil of the um, pine trees. It would more be that um, it, I, I'm sure even just like as your kids played underneath pine trees and stuff like that, it's dry under there in the rain. Um, and so they're, the logs aren't going to get rained on. So even just pulling them out of the canopy of the, um, of the pine trees, just at the edge so that they would get rained on, that's all you need to do. A lot of people, what they'll do is put them by their deck um one so they walk by them day in and day out i have mine i have some out by my mailbox so i walk by it every day i have some by my front deck um, because my front deck is the shady side of my house and i don't put them under the deck i put them right at the edge so that they kind of get a the wind break but they also get rained on you know if i put them under the deck they, they wouldn't get all the rain because the deck would kind of sheet it off so what you're trying to do is mimic that that environment of just being out in nature, getting rain, getting getting you know all of the elements naturally, but in dappled sunlight. So um, you don't have to be strict shade. It can be partially shady or mostly shady. It doesn't have to be full shade all day long um, because I actually have the majority of my stack is in a pile that for half the day it gets shade and half the day gets sun. It's mostly so that they're not just sitting in the sun all day long. Um, yeah, you're just trying to preserve the moisture on them. Okay. Well, yeah, there you go. Thank you. That that's helpful. That was really helpful. It helps me figure out what I where I can put these. Um, we do have another question in our chat, and um, uh, there was a concern, or is there a concern about non-native fungus spreading in the environment? So oysters are a native species. This is a good question. Oysters are a native species, and so are wine caps. They're they're found on like six of the seven continents. I, I, trees aren't out in Antarctica, so there's these. They're not in Antarctica, but they're on the other continents. Um, so the oysters and the wine caps, the the shiitakes are not like an invasive. They're they're not like crazy vigorous. Wine caps. So remember the ones in the in the garden beds. Those are such vigorous growers that those will move beyond where you put them. But they're like they're also like in the environment anyway. And the and so yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I have not heard of any concerns with these becoming an invasive species. Um, being somebody who gardens and everything, yeah, like I totally agree with like looking out for stuff like that. Um, 
it's not to say that it's like a contained system because of course you have mushrooms here they're going to cast their spores it's more that it's like it's such a small amount and they're not like crazy vigorous growers plus like the fungi that are out there what do we want them to do we want them to decompose stuff so that it creates soil it's um uh, yeah it, yeah i i haven't I haven't heard of anything negative about them like getting out in the wild yeah thank you that that's 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 good that's good to know um how about how about termites and other kinds of insects that might be camped out in your piles that are next to your deck that's next to your house with the wood siding i mean any concerns there uh i so i grew up in a log cabin um so we we always had something chewing on it that we always have to deal with i would more so be concerned that if you're treating your house for any of those that you'd be spraying near the thing that you're trying to grow food in um yeah there's always going to be a risk that if you're bringing a wood source near your house that it could migrate into your house um from what i've in in the log cabin that, that we lived in what i learned was that like termites like if you have concrete, if you know, you know, the concrete of your house or your, the foundation of your house. And if you put like, if you put wood and stuff right up to that, what the, the termites can migrate in from that wood up into the, the wood of your house. But if you have bare concrete and you're making sure that you're keeping that concrete bare, there, there's termites can't go from that source, the ground up into your house. You know, you're not giving them a way to transport their way in. Um, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. yeah, that sounds reasonable. Plus, I've never, I've never seen like termites in these logs, or or anything. Yeah, I've, I've never. So by the time they get so punky that they're falling apart, they're not going to grow mushrooms that you that you can eat anyway. You just hoof them in the woods. Have but, you had any experience with native wildlife coming around your piles of mushrooms and chewing them all up before you get to harvest? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, a simple thing is to throw a sheet over it. Okay. Yeah, that's it. like an old an old sheet that you don't mind looking at, and that you don't mind putting like, you know, bricks on top or whatever. Yeah, okay. it, it keeps the birds off, keeps the chipmunks and the squirrels out. It won't stop the slugs, but the slugs don't. You know, they just stop them from being pretty mushrooms. Well, I'm asking all the questions here. If uh, let and before we're gonna have to let Mark go because it is getting late. Um, so does anybody else in the program tonight um, have a burning question or maybe just a smoldering one? And if so, please feel free to unmute. Um, that's okay. And if not, if not, I think we want to um, say our thank yous tonight for having Mark Goskowitz from Tri Gable Lee Farm in Colchester, Connecticut. Um, I think you folks have lots of information that came out in the email um, regarding how to um, follow up more with some of the resources that were noted in the um, in the presentation. And you also have access to his website and how to get in touch with him if you have more questions. So that's all available there. I thank you all for sharing your evening with us tonight. I was fascinated by this. This sounds really exciting. There's a lot of different ways we can go with mushroom growing in our backyard. So yeah. i am uh, got to follow up. And uh, I thank you all again for um, sharing your evening with us here. Granby Public Library was very happy to host this series in our Granby Grows ser uh, program series. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Nice to, nice to make a connection with you too and uh and to start you know you know start a relationship with Granby. Thank you.